Hey, Colorado Church, it was so good to see all of you at our Easter services. It just filled my heart and we had spectacular weather and the kids enjoyed the bounce houses and the Easter egg hunt and the conversations lingered until early in the afternoon. I'm so grateful that we got to get together and we're still working on a building. We're actually waiting to hear word on something that's coming down that might work out in our favor to have our very own church building. I'm so excited to tell you once we get more information. But until we have a space of our own, we're gonna gather on the last Friday of every month. We're calling it Food Truck Fridays. We're gonna have a full church service, including Kids Church. And then afterwards, we're gonna hang out and eat together. So we'll be sending an email with all of that information in it. Your small group leaders already have those details. So ask them the next time you gather in your small group. Hey, this weekend is our first weekend in a brand new series on the Gospel of John. And we have Josh Polly preaching to us today. He's starting in John chapter one. Josh Polly is a friend of mine. I respect him and admire him. He's the best disciple maker I know. So open up your Bible, open up a notebook, and let's learn from what the scripture has to say. Let me pray for you and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we love you. We honor you. We thank you that we got to celebrate Jesus Christ risen from the grave and what that means to us on Easter Sunday. And now today, God, we push in to the story that one of the disciples wrote about Jesus, about his life and his legacy. And so, God, we ask that you would breathe over us, unlock our minds to understand what's written about you in your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen and amen. See you next week. Hello and welcome, Colorado Church, and everyone else who was led today to hear this message. It's an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to share with you today some of God's good grace. And I'm also um, honored and just uh, humbled the fact that Pastor Stephen and Pastor Evan have invited me back today to speak to our church. I'm just thankful for what God's put on my heart. Now, see, uh, Pastor Evan approached me and asked me if I'd be willing to speak on John, specifically chapter one today. And although I would like to say that's because I've got a lot of experience in there, or I'd like to say it's because it's one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible, the truth is the book of John is so incredible because it's the testimony of Jesus' unfailing love for all of humanity. And, you know, Christ's testimony is all the proof anyone needs to, to, to understand why we should spend time in God's Word. So my hope today is that you can experience the same life-changing uh, love that Christ has showed me as I've gotten to know his scripture and his word over the last several years of my life. So let's pray. Father God, we just invite you into this space. Not my words, but yours. Not my opinions, but your truth. God, please prepare our hearts, ready our hands and feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See, over the last several years, I've been asked numerous times, why the book of John? Why is it one of my favorite books of John? And, and uh, truthfully, besides the part that it's God's testimony, it's God's unfailing love in word format, which is in and of itself incredible, the truth is, it's one of my favorite books is because of the people that I've got to share it with over the years. Whether that be over a cup of coffee, uh, early in the morning, whether it was over a breakfast burrito for a week at a time, or even some people I've had the experience to share it with uh, over a couple of years, the course of a couple of years. What makes the book of John one of my favorite books is the people that I've got to experience it with. And I think that's one of the greatest things about reading the Bible and getting to know Jesus is the fact and the privilege that we have to share it with other people. So today, we're going to spend some time looking at the book of John, specifically the first chapter. And maybe for someone listening today, this transforming power is for you. As we dance our way into the book of John, I think that this is what John chapter one is all about. It's about giving his word away. 
And I wish I could teach you all the mysteries that I've uncovered or discovered from the first chapter of the book of John, but truthfully, I can't. In part because of the limited amount of time that I've been graciously offered today to share with you the message, but also in part because even after reading the first chapter of John hundreds of times over my life, every time I go to it, I still learn something new. That's, that's a great joy and gift about the Bible and, and God's word is I'm never bored. I've never been bored reading the same passage over and over again. God's always teaching me something new and he's always preparing my heart. So today, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend time in John 1. Now, if you will, it would be wonderful uh, if you'd grab a Bible, a journal, join with me. I, I, always, I always try to get a journal ready for me when I'm taking notes just because it's a great reflection. It's a great opportunity to, to keep note of what God's teaching us. So get that ready. You can join with me at the, the book of John, chapter 1. And today, I just want us to be thinking about it's one thing to see Jesus as a person written from the past, but it's another thing to experience Jesus as a person or a friend in the present deeply caring about our future. So today, just keep an open mind that Jesus is more than just ink on a paper. He's a person, active, living, then, now, and forevermore. And if you can understand that, it's gonna completely transform the way you read the Bible, and specifically today, the book of John. All right, now to start with, um, uh, I once had a wise wrestling coach that told me, if you don't know where to start, go back to the beginning. So we're gonna look at the beginning of John today. Now that same coach also told me that if you put a little Tabasco sauce in your jock strap, it might help cure the hiccups. Now thankfully, I did not listen to everything that my wrestling coach told me earlier on in life, and there's a good reason for that. But to honor his first nonsensical point about not knowing where to start going back to the beginning, we're gonna be looking at John. And in order to do that, we gotta understand who this John person is, the author, or at least the person who many scholars believe wrote the book of John, widely accepted. So in order to do that, I got a little trivia question for you. So the people around you, if someone's sitting next to you, see if you know the answer to this. But uh, who is John? Is it A, was John John the Baptist? Was it B, was he a son of Zebedee, the fisherman? C, was he a tax collector? Or D, was he my old wrestling coach? Tell, you, tell the person next to you what you think. All right. If you answered B, congratulations, you got it correct. All right. So let's take a look at John. He was indeed the brother of a person named James, not Jesus' half-brother, who was also called James, to make things more confusing. He was a son of Zebedee, who was a fisherman by trade. He might have been a disciple of John. Some people kind of point to that. John the Baptist. But definitely not a tax collector like Matthew. Two tax collectors would have been too taxing for Jesus. A huh? little dad joke right there for you today. And although he definitely wasn't my old wrestling coach, I bet he would have made a really good wrestler because he was given one of the nicknames as the Sons of Thunder, which in and of itself I think is a pretty sweet name. I remember in high school uh, wrestling a, cu a couple of guys. One of them named was Stryker. The other one was Tucker, kind of his younger brother. And these two were beasts. One was a three-time state champion. He only lost one match. It was to a four-time state champion in the finals round at state. Really good wrestlers. And I learned that if your name is a verb or something like like that, you know, Sons of Thunder, Striker, Tucker, you're probably going to be pretty good. Me, on the other hand, I had the last name of Polly, which was either an adorable parrot or a pocket-sized little uh, figurine that, you know, many girls kept in their pockets. So I had to really work to get my reputation up as a wrestler. But enough with me, let's go back to John. So additionally, uh, John was referred, and this is really important, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is important because when you're reading John, you might get a little confused because his name is John. He refers to another John, John the Baptist. And then when he talks about himself, he uses an alias as the one whom Jesus loved. That's why I typically offer food and coffee when I go over the book of John with somebody else, just because it can get a little confusing to start things off. Uh, John was also one of the three disciples whom Jesus was closest with. And I, I, these three disciples got to experience some miracles that other disciples didn't have the opportunity to. And then also, I think they were so important because Jesus used them in the early onset of the church, setting up the foundation for the church going forward. So really, John had an important role. 
all that to get to know John. And why I think it's so valuable um, to get to know an author before we, we, we dive into a book. As a teacher, before my students read a novel or a short story, we always spend time getting to know the author. And I do this because it's so powerful, that little space in between the end of a sentence, after a period, and before another sentence, when you get to know why might the author take you to that next step. When you get to understand those little breaths, those little beautiful moments in between. And I think it's the same exact thing for getting to know Jesus. When we spend time getting to know our Savior, when we go to the Word, we pick up so much more. So you have to know the author. You have to know who wrote it and why and the experiences because it's going to help you understand so much more. Pastor Evan is always giving us background, which I appreciate. As someone who likes to go into the Word, it's so important to understand the, the things outside of what just the Scripture says, the context. have to know the context. So now that we hopefully understand John a little bit better, let's study the Word of God together and see what Jesus has to teach us. If you would, please turn to the book of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament, and John 1 is composed of 51 verses. There are five subsections in there, and although I'm not going to read and uh, recite the entire 55 or 51 verses today, the goal is that we can kind of look through it and see what Jesus is doing here, and I think it's going to help us understand the message today about why it's important to give the word away. So, in the beginning, let's go back, literally, let's start in the beginning of John 1, and it states, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it or understood it. And if you're following along, and you're like me the first time I was reading John, I had a question. Why is the W capitalized on the word word? Why is it capitalized? Well, being an English teacher kind of had this thought that, well, usually when a word's capitalized, it's the beginning of a sentence, or in this case, it's a proper noun. It's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the word. And the last time I spoke at Colorado Church, we talked about in Isaiah chapter 6, how when King Uzziah had passed away and Isaiah had this revelation and was taken to the Lord, he stood before God and he's like, I should be undone because he recognized his sin. He recognized who he was and who God was. And he's like, I should be undone, but he wasn't. Why? Well, because in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God in the beginning. I think that Isaiah was looking looking at God through Jesus. And it says later on in the, in the book of John as well in the first chapter that no one has seen the Father except for Jesus, who is himself God and is in closest rela relationship with him and has made him known. Jesus makes the Father known to us. So when we have an experience with the Father, we're also having that experience with Jesus. Now, that's important to know as we go forward. And then moving forward to verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Why does someone come from the, or why would someone say that they come full of something unless they're going to give something? You know, and it says uh, later in John as well that uh, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. Jesus, in the beginning, he was there in the beginning, but he came as man to earth in order to give us grace and truth. And why is that important? Because we understand that the law, says it later on, I think in verse 17 or 18, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So just, just really important, we're gonna talk about Moses later on and that story of how Jesus, um, why it's so important that he came on later on in, in the importance of John. So the word became flesh. He came from the Father full of grace and truth. The very voice of Yahweh, spoken through prophets of old, promising deliverance and countless stories, would become flesh and make a way for eternal salvation. How could this be? God alludes to this throughout the entire Old Testament. What I love reading Old Testament stories to my kids is that anytime I do it, I am also know that I'm, I'm teaching them about Jesus. And that's this beautiful marriage between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you know the New Testament, when you read the Old Testament, all you're seeing is that this is about Jesus. 
It's sharing with me the hope that we have that a savior was going to come. For example, we look at the Tower of Babel. Mankind trying to get to God. Crazy people trying to build this huge tall tower to get to heaven. And God's like, you know what? You can't get to me. It's impossible for man to get to me. So what does he do? He destroys their plans, causes confusion because you know what? Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. Abraham and Isaac, we see the sorrow of a father seeing his son hurt in order to save someone else. Does that sound familiar? The story's about Jesus, and thankfully Isaac wasn't sacrificed. Thankfully, because we know that he couldn't have been the sacrifice that we needed. Only Jesus could have been that sacrifice. Later on, we look at Joseph's story, who was forced to leave home. He was betrayed for pieces of silver. He was innocent, and at the end of it all, he still chose to forgive those, those who betrayed him. Does that sound familiar? Jesus. Another example, we see Jesus. David, an unexpected hero who overcomes a great enemy. You know, even David's father and his brothers laughed when Saul came to ask um, to see the people because they didn't think that he could be king. He wasn't king status. He was just tending sheep. Sounds like somebody else that I know in the New Testament who a lot of people didn't think he could be the Messiah because of the way that he came. He was humbled. Jesus. Moses, humanity tries to find salvation through rules, but only realizes their need for a savior even more. We see this in verse 16, that out of his fullness, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, as I had mentioned before. (sighs) Moving forward, we're gonna see that the second section of John chapter one is titled, John the Baptist denies being the Messiah. So we know that John the Baptist and John the author, two different people, okay? So who is he? Well, after the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders asked him the same question, they came and asked him, who are you? You know, if you're, this is John the Baptist they're referring to. And, and he's like, give us an answer so we can take back to those who sent us. And John the Baptist replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet. He's referring specifically to Isaiah 40 verse 3. In the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. And we see that in Isaiah 40, chapter, or verse 3, when, he's, when the prophecy is, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You see, John the Baptist is talking about preparing the way for Jesus. And the other day, I had this beautiful revelation as I was studying the Word, and somehow I managed to get to the two blank pages in the middle of the Bible. If you know what I'm talking about, that's the section between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the first time I saw that, Honestly, I thought it was a place to put notes. When I saw those two pages when the first time I was, you know, reading the Bible and I was going through, I'm like, this is a nice little place, you know, I wish there was more of them. I got to wait to the whole end of the, the, New Te- the Old Testament. But what I've come to realize is those two pages represent a beautiful truth. Even though there were 300 years of silence where God didn't really speak through prophets, uh, there wasn't a lot, re- you know, recorded in the Bible. We don't have a lot of information in that time. What we do know is that God was still working. God was still preparing an amazing transformation. He was bringing the way for his son, Jesus Christ, to come into the world. And how do we see that? Why do we know that? Well, because the Roman Empire is being ushered in. Now, some people might be saying, why is that a good thing that the Roman Empire was around? Didn't they do a lot of horrible things? Well, think of this. Who put the roads, in the words of Isaiah chapter 40, who built the roads all over the Roman Empire? Who made it possible for after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, who made it possible for the early Christians in the church to spread the word throughout the region? It was the Romans. They built the roads to make it easy, okay, to to, to, to connect places and people groups. So God is always in control. And we can choose to glorify him, but regardless, God's gonna be glorified in the end. But for me, I wanna be someone who willingly and joyfully glorifies God and gives him praise. There's so much more reward in that. So just a thought to be thinking about. After John the Baptist denies being the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet, and after he testified about Jesus, John then goes on to explain, John the author, goes on to explain two accounts where Jesus begins gathering his disciples. What I've come to appreciate about these two accounts is how Jesus began 
his ministry. Listen to this. He chose people who would choose people. Jesus was very strategic. He chose people who would choose people. And again, we see this in the, the last two sections of John where um, Jesus' followers, um, John's disciples follow Jesus, and then uh, we also see it with Jesus calls Philip. So kind of the two in sections on there. And the first example was Andrew. Okay, Andrew uh, was one of the disciples who might have been probably a disciple of John the Baptist. And when he heard Jesus come by, John said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And uh, Andrew decides he's going to leave John and follow this Jesus. He says, Rabbi, where are you going? Jesus responds, come follow me and you'll see. So he's, he goes, he spends the rest of the day with him. And it must have been so transformational that he goes and finds the one person who he probably loves the most in the world, and that's his brother. He finds Simon. Uh, so he goes and finds Simon. He says, Simon, we found the one. That is Christ, the, the Messiah. Come. So he takes him to Jesus. He takes him to where he's at. And Jesus, as he sees uh, Simon approaching, he says, Simon, son of John, you are to be called Cephas. And what's beautiful about this is that God calls us, but he's the one that does the transformation. God, Jesus does a transformation in us when we go to him. When we spend time in the word, he's transforming us. It says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Christ is doing the transformation in us, the work. The second account that we see is with Philip. And Philip uh, says the next day Jesus was on his way. He was leaving. He was going to go to Galilee. And on the way, he found Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. We're not really sure what happens with that whole context of that conversation, but what we do know is that it's so powerful that he gets up and leaves and finds someone who means so much to him. And he finds Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, we found the one that the prophet spoke about and also the one that Moses wrote about in the law. That is Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And I love Nathaniel's response. Uh, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? You know, he's just kind of like doubting. He knows the scripture. He knows that they must all be anticipating that there's a savior coming. But he, for some reason, Nazareth just doesn't check off his, all of his boxes on there. So anyways, even though he's probably reluctant, he still goes to see this Jesus. And what Jesus does, and I'm gonna back up real quick. What Philip doesn't do is he doesn't try to persuade. He doesn't try to argue the point. He realizes that if he takes Nathaniel to the source itself, it will speak on its own behalf. He doesn't have to validate who Jesus is because he knows that Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. So he takes him, and Jesus, seeing Nathaniel approaching, says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And as he's looking at him, Nathaniel says, how do you know me? Probably a little, you know, standoffish, like, what do you mean? You don't really know me. You're just saying things flattery. And then he says something so simple but yet so profound. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Nathaniel called you. And again, I don't know the context. I don't know what uh, Nathaniel was thinking while he was underneath that fig tree, but I can tell you this. The next part where Nathaniel responds tells me that it was something transformational. I'm guessing that Nathaniel was probably going through something very, very serious in his life because for Jesus to see him where he was underneath the fig tree and to know his thoughts, his innermost heart, what was going on, it completely transforms Nathaniel's life. And what happens next is Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, which means teacher, says, truly, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. What a declaration from going from not even understanding that this person could be good, you know, saying, back talking about where he comes from and everything. And for Jesus to say one thing, going to the source, it completely transformed his life. That's what the word of God will do to you and to me when we spend time in it. It will completely transform your life and wreck the old and bring in the new. That's what Jesus does. So to take away, if we have one other takeaway you could take from this, both of these accounts, is that what do we do when we experience Jesus? Do we go tell someone or do we just close our Bible and keep it on a shelf? What are we doing with the word of God? What are we doing with the knowledge of who Christ is? I hope we're sharing it. I hope we're going out and giving it away. To conclude our time together, let's go once again to the beginning. Why did the word become flesh? I believe there are many reasons why Jesus came to earth as man. 
But what I want to understand, I want you, what I want us to understand today is that Jesus, he saved the world all on his own, but he did not choose to change the world on his own. Let me say this again. Jesus saved the world all on his own, but he did not choose to change the world on his own. God is good, Colorado Church. God is good. He chose men and women to continue the work. What good work are you doing today? And how will you reflect his love to others tomorrow? As I look back at the book of John, I see that the chapter ends with an invitation for the beginning of some of his disciples. That's John 1. That's what it's about. It ends with an invitation. The calling of his disciples. Yet chapters 2 through 21, the rest of the book of John, is all about the journey. And I'm excited because I think the next several weeks we're going to be looking at the rest of the book of John, the, the journey that Jesus is going to call us on. There's so much more. Don't stop at the end of your life knowing just chapter 1. Use the time to experience the rest of the gospel. If you haven't experienced the Word's invitation, he is standing at the door knocking. Answer it. And once you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't just let him in, but let him lead you out. Let me say that again. Don't just let Jesus don't just let Jesus into your heart. Let him lead you out of your home. Let him be with you Monday through Saturday at work, with your family, your finances. Everywhere you go, he wants to be a part of it. That's the kind of church this nation needs. That's the kind of reality that we need to step into. How can we do this practically? How can we practice? How can we do this practically? Well, in college, I was very fortunate enough to have a, a mentor named Jeff, Jeff Huskerson, and he was the leader of the Navigators on campus where I went to school at. And one of the first times I sat down with Jeff at, at the, the, the main building there at the campus, he asked me a simple yet profound question. Josh, how do you spend time in the Word? And I gave him the best answer I could at the time, which is great because that's where I was in the journey at that time. But yet he took me a step further and he said, Josh, I want to give you just maybe a few steps that you could do to really help improve this time that you spend in the Word. And I said, absolutely, let me hear it. And he just gave me a few practical steps that I'd like to share with you today. Step one, spend 15 minutes at the beginning of each day with Jesus. Grab a book and a Bible. 15 minutes before you get busy. 15 minutes before you go to work. 15 minutes before the kids get up. Spend 15 minutes, even if you can just do 15 minutes with him, apart from distractions to start your day off, that's the first step. Open your Bible. Open a journal. <sighs> start, um, and when I say open the Bible and, and believe that Scripture is God-breathed. I, I, I never open the Bible if I'm spending time in the journal without saying the Scripture. All God all scripture is God breathed, useful for teaching, correcting, and rebuking, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to handle his word. I say that every single time I step in to this word because that is confirming a truth that I believe. And I tell you, God's never disappointed me. So, one, set the time aside, grab a Bible and journal, and then believe that God's going to show up. Start in the beginning of a book, possibly John. Start somewhere else, but find a place to camp out in and spend time there. Okay, spend time there. Pray over your time in the Word. Ask God to soften your heart, to speak to you, to prepare you for what He's going to tell you. All Scripture is God-breathed. Then, read a small section. A few verses, a small passage at most, but don't read a lot. There's so much in every verse. I love when Pastor Evan speaks because he breaks one sentence down that could be a, a list of uh, sermons because there's that much. God is always speaking. So, start small, okay? Don't just think quantity. Think quality. All right, start small. Then meditate, research, and listen. I spend so much of my time either in my uh, study Bible or online. There's so many resources, and I'll, I'll pull five to ten different people and their interpretations of a verse, and I'll compare them, and then I'll ask God to speak to me on that as well. And then what I do that, that I think is probably one of the most steps that most people overlook is I journal. I take the time to reflect on what God has spoken to me. I have probably over 10 journals just from high school where times that God has met me in just a secret, quiet place and has given me revelation after revelation, truth after truth. He's spoken good things over me. And sometimes he's corrected me on things too in my life. And that's okay because God loves me and he wants the best for me. So keeping a record of that helps me to build 
to build my faith up. I can look back at here when the enemy comes to seek, destroy, and devour things in my life. I can, one, hold up God's word and say, no, that's not true. And then two, I can go into my journal and say, God, you delivered me from this. God, you delivered me from this. I have proof of what Christ has done in my life. And I encourage you to do the same. And then lastly, pray over the time. Thank God. God loves when you glorify and honor him and thank him. Just like a parent loves to be thanked for, for their kid when something special happens, God rejoices in the truth. God rejoices when we're just gra- grateful for being with him. If God puts it on your heart to share what he has taught you during any of these times, listen, you don't have to have all the answers when you share the word of God with somebody else. In fact, you won't have all the answers, so don't pretend to. All the answers you need are in the word. Go there and let the Holy Spirit guide your conversations. If you have a question about the book of John or about Jesus, I, or Pastor Stephen, Pastor Evan, would be honored to have a chance just to hear from you or talk to you. Find somebody who you know loves the Lord. Ask them. Spend time with them. Find a mentor. Find somebody in your life who can sit down with you and look at the the Word of God together. Let's go ahead and pray. I just want to say a blessing over our church today. Father God, we thank you for this time. I thank you for the truths that you've spoken to us. I thank you for your love. And most importantly, we thank you for Jesus Christ. God, the eternal hope and salvation that we have through him. Lord, if anybody here listening today hasn't made the decision to follow after you, I just pray that they would get down on their knees and and ask you into their heart to confess that they are in need of a savior, that they would believe Jesus, that you are the son of God who came the only one who could take away sins, the only one, Father God, they'd put their hope and trust in you and they would not just let you into their hearts, but God, they would let you lead, that you would lead them out of their homes, Father God, and into the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you, Colorado Church, and use you to proclaim his good news this week in the days of head. Thank you, Colorado Church, for being here today. In agreement with our pastors here, I look forward to celebrating you in person again soon. God bless. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the Hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
sing a little louder 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 In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder Louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder The storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar love from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive and i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar Goodness of 
the goodness you grow. Goodness.